Um, today we have John Towsley, and uh, John has given us his wonderful photo there uh, in the dog days of summer here. So um, uh, John is the uh, co-founder of the BeWise group of companies, of which ThoughtRock is a, uh, a major component. Um, and John has extensive experience in IT and in the IT education marketplace. He began his career at Nabisco Brands in IT, then established and ran his own multi-site IT education and consulting business in Canada and the United States. He served on CompTIA as A Plus and Network Plus Advisory Councils and is a seasoned ITIL expert. So we welcome back John Tosley. John. Thanks, Rick, and welcome everybody to today's session. As promised, we're going to talk about um, ITIL from a business manager's perspective. And as entrepreneurs, both Rick and I, quite often look at the idle industry and marketplace and what our customers are doing and reflect on how important it is as shareholders and stakeholders in an organization to understand how and where business impact comes from any initiative. And idle is really no different. So we're going to focus on that today and hopefully you'll get some value out of that and, and perhaps be able to, within your own organization, derive some value or at least some lively discussion about what it is doing for you and how you may or may not change your approach as you go forward. So we're going to take a look at that and as Rick said, please feel free to uh, ask any questions as we go along. I'm going to step you back first to uh, some point in your career or your education where you may have seen or taken some economics courses. And one of the things that you probably were exposed to is this formula. So the economists will tell you that uh, over the long term, supply equals demand. And now you say, JT, I don't believe you. What do you mean supply equals demand? Because I see those things out of balance all the time. Well, let's use a, a simple example. If a hurricane comes through the Gulf Coast and some of the refineries uh, in the Gulf of Mexico go offline, then what you see is supply drop. And as supply drops, then you say, well, if supply equals demand, then demand should drop, but that's not what happens. Actually, as the demand drops, or the supply drops, the demand goes up. And it goes up because people start to hoard. They see this as a scarce resource. They think prices are going to rise. Um, they start to purchase. And sure enough, what happens is there is a change in price. And generally, what happens is the price will rise. And that has the effect in the longer term of decreasing demand. And, and so we get back to an equilibrium with this formula where supply equals demand. Now, if we take that and extrapolate it onto the IT world that we all know and love, one of the things that we see is this sort of artificial cap on the supply of IT services to our organizations. So essentially, the business says, hey, you know, here's your budget, um, and so that's all you can supply to us. But as we all know, the demand for IT services is essentially infinite. So I like to say that the demand for the services of those of us in IT is only limited to the imagination of the executives who are flying around on airplanes and reading about the latest gadgets and gizmos and, you know, all the things that we should be able to do at the push of a button from an IT perspective. So that's the dilemma that I think we face as IT professionals. We have a cap demand, but an, or a cap supply, but an infinite request for, for demand of services. And, and John, with respect to cap supply, don't you typically see that as IT projects get approved through different cycles that that actually, that cap is removed, or do you still see that as a, as a cap? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there is some flexibility in IT budgets. Um, if new initiatives come up you know, sort of mid-year and a project gets launched, then there may be an, a, a budget increase associated with a particular project. But by and large, in most organizations, what we see is IT people are bound to the same budgeting cycles as the rest of the business. So if you look at um, you know, idle and processes, if you look at the financial process, what you'll see is we talk about two budgets. There's the capital budget and there's the operational budget. And those are actually pretty fixed. So once a year we sit down and say, well, how much hardware and stuff do we need for our infrastructure and what's our budget to buy new gear this year? That's the operational budget. And then on the services side, we say, well, how many people do we need and you know, what's our, our cost going to be for communication services and so on? And that operational budget is pretty much 
fixed as well. So while there is a little bit of flexibility, the reality, I think, is that for most of us, it's capped. The other reality that I think I see in most organizations is, by and large, the business is looking at the IT budgets, both operational and capital, and saying, we give you enough. You guys are already spending uh, too much money for what you're providing. So good question. And, and the question is, can IDLE help that? And where does IDLE fit into all of that? And, and you know, why does it matter? And here's what we see, or at least what I see. So if we, if we look at the IDLE system lifecycle that was introduced with version 3, you kind of say, well, you have a service strategy at the center and then service design transition and service operation. I think, by and large, those of us in the industry have recognized that this is a pretty good way to look at IT services because we are in this cycle and continually trying to improve things. So it's a little better view than, than IDLE had previously described to us. Service strategy is at the center for a reason. Interestingly enough, our experiences as practitioners in the industry and consultants is that most people don't spend much time or really understand service strategy. And, and if you attended my session on service strategy, you might know my thoughts on that and why I think that's true. And it's partly because when IDLE v3 was released, the service strategy um, component, in my personal opinion, was way too overcomplicated. So it, it describes the best practice, but not the best practice from an IT service perspective. It describes the best practice of creating strategy uh, in any industry or sector. And it's really, really good. great document, well detailed, um, but in my mind, overkill. So back to our topic du jour, you know, what does that have to do with uh, oops, uh, yeah, idle? And what does it have to do with connecting idle to the business? Well, let's take a look at this, what I call the snake diagram. This is a, a diagram we created and use when we're uh, training and consulting to to folks in the IT sector on idle. It's an oversimplification of all of the processes. There are more, and obviously there are, if you drew all the connections between all the processes, you would not be able to read the diagram. But I'd like to use it because it is a simplification and it helps us understand where things connect and specifically where things connect to the business. So in this case, what you see is service strategy um, drawn at the top for some pragmatic reasons. And actually, when you think it through and look at what's going on in service strategy, there are some processes and some activities that clearly are the connection points to the business from an IT service perspective. So in particular, if we look at this diagram, we say, well, you know, there's a, a couple of different components we want to think about. We talked about that budgeting stuff. And you'll notice in here there's these concepts of return on investment and return on value. Um, and that's where the business is looking to IT to understand how are we going to set these budgets and what are we going to approve. So rightly so, business managers across any organization, even not for profits and associations, will typically look at any investment they're making, including IT, and they'll say, you know, what are we getting for our money, essentially? And that's that return on investment component. What we can do from an idle perspective and an IT perspective to help answer that question is really two things where idle impacts. The first is we can define some processes that will help us manage that demand component. And so clearly, demand management is one of those. If we're good at it and we are defining what our service catalog and service portfolio are going to be, then we're basically communicating back up to the business and saying, hey, here's the things we do for you. And here's the return on the investment you're making in those things that we do for you. And by the way, from a demand management perspective, here's a process that I have that is going to help you set our priorities. The objective, in my mind, from an idle perspective, in 
if you really understand what you're trying to accomplish, it's not about you know managing the number of incidents or customer service levels internally, although we talk a lot about that. It's being able to go back to the business and say, hey, we do a good job at this, we're efficient at this, and we're also adding value by helping you understand how we can manage demand. So we're looking at the external factors in demand management that is, what are the things that our business is doing for its customers? By and large, every business has customers. Even associations and not-for-profits have customers. And those are the things that ultimately are driving the demand for IT services. So if we look and take a strategic view from an IT perspective, we can actually impact the demand for our services and help the business make strategic decisions about the kind of things they're going to do and what the trickle-down effect is on IT. So probably you're looking and saying, well, that's all good theory, but you know, it, it's not necessarily pragmatic or you may not be able to see how that impacts your organization. Let me come back to the other piece in terms of understanding how we know we're efficient. Most of the organizations we see when they execute on idle will start down here with incident management. And you say, well, why is that? Well, here's what we see happening. Help desk managers, service desk managers are typically getting pushed in that budget cycle to reduce their costs. They're also getting screamed at because the visible side of IT tends to be through the service desk. It's really the window to IT services. If that's not functioning well, what we see happening is executives throughout the corporation, the colleagues and peers of your CIO or VP of IT, are screaming at the CIO or VP of IT to improve the service levels. Hey, my people can't do this, my people can't do that, your help desk is helpless, et cetera, et cetera, in the worst cases. So what happens is the service desk manager goes out and looks and says, how do other people do this? Or the CIO might direct them and say, listen, find out how other people do this. And what they find is idle. So they come to idle through the incident management process and, and through the incident management uh, issues, if you will. And they start working on process improvement. And for the most part, they'll have some success. So as they start to have success, other people, i.e. people in operations, people managing change start to look to the service desk and say, well, how did you improve and, and what did you do? And, and you start to see the groundswell for idle initiatives in the business. That's all well and good. For today's topic, I think you want to step back a little bit and what you see is all of these service transition and service operation processes are where the rubber meets the road in terms of being able to go back to the business at budget time up here. Because the first thing the business will say is, we give you guys enough money, you're just not efficient. Now, if you think about that, how do you counter that argument? So it's kind of he said, she said, if we don't have some metrics and some facts. And to me, that's one of the big benefits and connection of implementing idle and idle metrics and reporting is our ability at budget time to go back to the business and say, uh, no, we're not inefficient, and here's how we know we're not inefficient. So those of you sitting out there might say, hmm, well, what does that look like? And it looks like some pretty simple reporting flowing out of the idle processes. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes, but if you're looking at this, you're saying, well, how many changes did we do? How many of those changes were successful? How many failed? What was the impact on the business of how many failed? And more to the point, how do we stack up against the industry? So what are other people in our industry doing or in the IT world at large doing? How many people do they have managing their incidents? What's their cost per call? What's our cost per call? So you start to see how you can arm your CIO, your VP, with the facts and stats they need at this time to go back to the business and say, listen, we're not inefficient. We're actually pretty good at what we do. Um, 
so I'm here to help you. I'm here to service you, but you got to set the priorities. It's not okay just to stand at budget time and say you got to do more with the same amount of money. And that's where I really see the benefit from IDLE in organizations that have done a good job at in implementing it is that connection back from the processes and services, the metrics that flow out of those processes and services to the budget cycle saying, yes, we're efficient, and now as your partner, here's my strategy for delivering IT service to you. Which services do you want or need? Set the priority and let's set the budget. I get it that we can't spend an unlimited amount of money, but it's you as the owners of the business and the drivers of the business that need to make the decisions and trade-offs about what services IT will provide. And we can work with you to understand which ones will have strategic impact from the demand management process all the way back out to our external customers. So what are the things that are critical and what are the things that we really don't need? And you'll see things start to fall off. Maybe as a benefit to our employees, we don't need to provide them with uh, enough bandwidth to see their kids at daycare, as a trivial example. So that's kind of how we see things connecting uh, from the idle process back to the influence on the business and the impacts on the business. And let's take a, a closer look at... John, just a quick question there. You've got sure. configuration management kind of smack in the middle. Are, is, there, is there any reasons for that? I mean, you, are you basically saying at all that config is the most important? Uh, good question. I, I think, A, the truth is it's kind of a coincidence that it sits there in the middle. The answer is, in mature idle shops, you you do get stuck if you don't have at least some decent rudimentary configuration management process and some kind of a configuration database, even if it's not a federated um, service. It, and it's, it's kind of fun that it's in the center of the diagram because as you get mature in the other processes or start to mature the other processes, you will get stuck if you don't know what you own and what you have. And then there's clearly uh, that connection between configuration management and the service catalog. So, so you start to look at, hey, here are the services that we're providing, um, and the tie back to the operational budget is clearly through configuration management. So interestingly enough, what we saw in the early days of idle adoption, certainly across North America, was uh, a fairly concerted effort early on to go out and tag all the assets and build up a the you know mother load system in terms of configuration management. By and large, those initiatives didn't succeed well because the other processes weren't mature enough to maintain and update it. So you have to m mature everything kind of as you go. You can spend a lot of money hiring summer students to run around and tag assets and key all the data into the system, but if your change management system and your incident system aren't mature enough to keep that data up to date, then that's kind of a waste of money. So, good question. All right, so we've actually just touched on service catalogs. One of the things that's become super important, remember I've been talking about arming the CIO or VP with the ability to go back to the business and say, hey, here's what we do for you. One of the things I like about the refresh of idle back to version three was, you know, the research that said, hey, the people who do this really well actually have two kinds of service catalogs. So we have the stuff that's near and dear to our heart from this technical service perspective. And, you know, those are all the wonderful things that we understand as IT professionals in terms of how services are related to support and hardware and software and applications and data and, and the whole convoluted mess that is behind the, the behind the curtain to use the Wizard of Oz kind of example. What I like here is the ability or at least the concept to say, hey, what we need to be able to show the business and explain certainly at budget time and other times is that these are the things that we do for you. And we're going to put these in language that you understand uh, so that when you ask us about a service, it's related to the business 
you can see a connection from the service we provide through the impact on the business. Whether that's, you know, in a simple case, we provide a customer relationship management service to you. You may see it as an end user or the sales manager or VP of sales or marketing as, you know, the CRM. Um, but behind the scenes, we know that there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on there, and you don't care about that. So I really like this uh, perspective and change that came really with the idle version 3 refresh. And I think it's important to understand that that is a very solid mechanism for arming our executives to be able to go back to the business and explain what we're doing and what it costs without getting into all this technical hismo gizmo that they don't want to know about. And John, would you say that companies are actually publishing service catalogs this way? And if the answer is no, why do you think that is? Well, there's another good question. Um, I would say actually not most of the ones I've seen. Um, the reason for that probably is that while this is best practice, it's one of the interesting things about idle, right? Best practices across all of the defined idle processes are probably not practiced across any one organization. They're more selected and say, hey, these guys do this and that's the way you should do it, and these guys do this and that's the way you should do it. Um, I think there are probably are a few companies that do this very well. Um, they're not the ones I've met, and I think the reason for that is that there's not a strong understanding about the value and the benefits of this, and as of today, most of the software applications that help you automate service catalogs come at it from a technical perspective. The other thing is, as IT professionals, uh, what we tend to do, we come at it from a technical perspective, and we just have personalities and bents, I guess, that tend to overcomplicate things um, and not take the business perspectives. The organizations where I have seen, I, I actually have seen some, um, that are successful doing this tend to have um, approached IT from the latest trend, if you will, and they've cycled out, to put it politely, the CIOs or VPs of IT who are technical and put in people uh, who come with a business bent. So you get the dreaded MBA or you'll actually get somebody cycling from another business unit who's not a technical person, but it, is then put in charge of running IT. That's a trend in the industry, and I think it's got a lot of merit. And those organizations will tend to move more in, in this direction, primarily because that senior executive is saying, explain this to me in words that I understand and that I can explain to my colleagues. And that can drive that business service catalog that, that I think does have a lot of value. So I thought I'd skip and just, you know, give you an example because I know from our training initiatives that this can be a bit confusing in terms of understanding what a service is. So we developed a fairly simple example. If you look at a payroll service, you know, to the business, it's payroll service. You know, all our employees and contractors get paid on a regular basis, whether that's once a week or bi-monthly or every two weeks, whatever we decide. And that's a service that you provide to me from an IT perspective. On the back end, from an IT perspective, you know we understand that it has all of these different components and that they overlap with other services that we provide. So in fact, I can provide the payroll service, but in order to provide the payroll service, I also have to provide the desktop service because the folks in HR uh, and HR payroll need to be able to get on and access the timesheets and approve the timesheets and go through all of the things that need to be done. So they need network connectivity and all those things. Then there's that whole layer in the center, right, where we're saying as IT professionals, ooh, that's sensitive data. We know a whole bunch of things about what has to happen, you know, to protect that data in terms of access and backup and business continuity and all of that kind of stuff. So. We break down some of the details, but from a business perspective, they just want to know that they can do the payroll, and that's really the way that they look at it. So we might show them that previous diagram so that they get a sense of the different services and the high level that they're understanding. So if I just pop back quickly, you'll see that might be a view that we use for them. And 
by and large, they'll appreciate that. Right, the business will get their heads around the fact that we have to have security and actually uh, understand it, and as I said, appreciate it, and the fact that we know kind of what the high-level services are with respect to that. Behind the scenes, as IT people, this is really the business service catalog example, or the the IT service catalog example, where we're looking at all of the things that are happening in the systems and the servers the network connections, uh, the support options, um, you know, the network requirements, the cabling requirements, infrastructure, in order to do all of these things and the external communication interfaces, right? So, hey, we've got to get the timesheet data entry stuff and then that's got to all be flowed through a process and approved and then eventually we're going to do electronic fund transfer out to multiple banks depending on how big our organization is and all the wonderful places that people decide to do banking these days. So, so there's a, a much more detailed look, and that's really the IT service catalog. The benefit back to the business, if you look at business impact once again, is that we understand all that, and we can show the business based on metrics that we're good at doing all of this, and we do it all as well or better than other people in the industry. So yes, that's how much it costs you to do payroll. But when they ask about the service, I can explain it in business terms that they can understand. Hopefully hey, John. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually a question related to um, some of this, this slide as well as the slide previous. Um, and I'll just I'll read the question. So on the last question asked, you said IT people tend to come from a technical background and, and bring things that tend to overcomplicate things. Does this imply in spite of implementing ITIL, that IT people are still not focused on the business, but they typically are, they always bring the element of being internally focused. Hmm. I, I, I guess it's unfair of me to, to uh, tar everyone with the same brush, uh, but, but by and large, it is still what we see when we're in doing training and consulting, um, that IT folks do take um, that, that very technical focus. What I've seen, and actually was in a, a meeting from a completely different perspective yesterday, um, as some of you may know, what part of the, the BYS group of companies includes um, a business that does focuses on learning and e-learning in particular. So I was helping a com customer with strategy on that, and in the room, I was glad to see was an IT representative, um, and he's really a business analyst, so he's the liaison between the sales training department in this particular case and the IT department. Um, so the fact that we need a liaison in the first place would tell me that everybody else he works with doesn't know how to talk to the customer. Um, and I may be being over cruel, but you saw my pictures, so just the way I feel some days. Uh, the other thing is that I noticed that this guy's uh, security badge said uh, contractor. So I'm not sure how heavy the commitment is in that particular organization, and it's a large global organization, to being able to, to speak in business terms. So I think by and large, and fairly so, the skills and competencies that we require in IT tend to attract people who are logical, analytical thinkers. You know, maybe geeks is too strong a word, but that's the way we are. You know, we, we like bits and bytes, and we think about that. And by and large, we don't think in terms of customer focus. We pat ourselves on the back if we do a lot of thinking about our internal customer, customer satisfaction through SLAs. But the reality is most of us don't think all the way through to the customers. I'm not sure if that answers the question. It's a long way of saying, yeah, <laughs> most of us are still techies at heart. And uh, when we try to solve that problem, we try to solve it by sticking a bit of a band-aid on it um, rather than changing our culture to say we're going to we're going to be business focused and we're going to also reach out and try to understand the external business impact of all the things that we do and it may always be that way I'm not sure that uh, you know idols no magic bullet for that but I think it can help so I, I talked a little bit about you know, metrics and measurements and the kind of things we can arm our executives with. And I just thought I'd better put up some examples of that um, so you can see exactly how some of these idle processes can help in terms of tying things back at budget time and in terms of justification. So 
if you look at service catalog and service level management, then there are some basic metrics, right? The number of services, the number of service level agreements we have in place. Um, you know, you may drill down further from that and say, well, you know, what are the percentages of service levels and so on. I'm a bit allergic to that one. Um, yeah, although I think it's important to have that. You know, what we tend to do from an IT perspective, A, nobody wants to say that our service levels won't, weren't good. So there's a built-in fudge factor there. And the way we tend to fudge things is we'll say, you know, we have 99.9999% uptime. Uh, the example I'll use there from a business perspective, I used to own a very large photocopier. And the manufacturer of that photocopier, uh, when I called and screamed and said, this thing's a piece of junk, would come in and say, your copier works better than any other copier in the whole city. You have an uh, 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 uptime, and most of them break more often than that. The challenge I had was that that small percentage of time it broke was exactly when I was busiest, which was exactly when I needed it, and there was a direct impact. I was producing manuals. As Rick said, I used to own a training company. I was producing manuals for training classes. If I didn't have the books in the class, then either the class didn't go and or the customer wanted a refund. It came out of my pocket. So it's fine from an IT perspective to measure those stats, but you've got to think from the business perspective. So you know, using idle terms, what we ended up doing is I said, okay, that's all well and good, but I don't have a business continuity strategy. So it may be that, that nobody makes a photocopier that's more reliable than the one I have, um, but we haven't thought through what I'm doing as a business, so I can't afford to have any downtime. What's my 100% redundancy strategy? So that's what I, I put in purple here, whatever that color is. You got to look at the business impact and those external impacts and understand what, what that's all about. And then, once again, I think you really want to look at the cost uh, if you can find it, what's the cost of the services we're providing versus the rest of the industry? So are we efficient? So can I, in earnest, stand up and essentially prove to my colleagues at budget time that A, you couldn't outsource this and get better service for less money or the same service for less money, and B, uh, none of our other competitors are doing it any better than we are. Um, and, and that's, to me, one of the gems of idle if you're a well-run shop you have these kind of numbers. Similarly for incident. How many incidents, all the stuff that we typically look at measuring, answer time, talk time, call times, first call resolutions, you know, escalations, how much stuff is open, calls by class. So all of those metrics, the key performance indicators coming out of those are the things that are going to allow you to justify having that service inside versus uh, outsourcing it. So what are the cost per calls? You know, what's our ratio of staff per desktop, um, our staff per number of services? You know, a lot of organizations have very complex infrastructures in terms of the numbers of applications they, they support because their businesses are complicated. And then the other one is customer satisfaction. And there's some interesting tools out there for benchmarking and measuring customer satisfaction internally and or externally that I would urge you to look at because you can have all the stats in the world, but if the perception of your internal or external customers is that you're not doing a good job, that is actually the reality. So once again, what's the business impact from all that stuff? And what are we doing? And this is potentially a little counter to the job role, but you know, I always thought when I ran a service desk that my job was actually to try and make myself obsolete. If I could make all those calls go away, I would. You know, and then go do something more important for the business. And I don't mean that to be belittle service desk teams. Um, I think they're crucial and important to the business, and well-run ones do have a positive impact on the business. But ultimately, your goal is to keep that budget as low as possible. Um, and that means looking at the business and understanding what's the source of those calls and how do I eliminate them. We see new technologies coming in all the time. Right, interestingly, some of them from our e-learning and learning business that can help drive down call volumes. So that to me is a real benefit from idle if you understand what you're doing and, and have the data and can do some analysis on that data and go back to the business and say, if you just stop doing this, then that would drive your cost down. And even small businesses, uh, ThoughtRock itself, I, I know that our marketing 
person is listening in, Jamie, and we have these conversations all the time. Hey, ThoughtRock members should have 24 by 7 support, you know, with less than a 30 second answer time. Okay, really? Um, can we do that? How do we do it? How do we make it cost effective? Right, and uh, you need to be able to drive those conversations at the business level. In order to do that, you have to have the data. So certainly, Rick and I spend a little bit of time getting down in the weeds, looking at the data, the call volumes, where the calls coming from, what's a, what's an appropriate response time for a Thought Rock member for that kind of a call? Do they really expect us to to give them an answer instantly, or are they cool with waiting for 24 hours? Those are the kind of business impact discussions you want to have. And you want to have them from that help desk or service desk professional level. Idle best practices drive the metrics necessary to have the data and, and to be able to have intelligent discussions and help the business make decisions about the service level they're going to provide to your external customer. Similarly with change. You know, the reality I think still is that uh, most of the changes we make are initiated by IT. and. Um, you know, by and large, we pat ourselves on the back for putting out the fires that we lit. It, idle helps us to change that. It helps us get out of that firefighter hero mentality. Um, I always tell customers in consulting, as we get through to the bare bones meat of this conversation, in order to successfully execute on best practice, idle or otherwise, you will go through some cultural change. There are people in your organization who won't like it. Um, and some of those people will weed themselves out, you know, hey, I don't want to be in this kind of organization. I, the way I like to work, I like to come into work every day and see what, what's on fire and, uh, you know, what's my challenge for the day. Um, some people just like that and it, uh, it may change as you successfully implement best practices and get out of firefight mode and get into a more calm, proactive, uh, well-measured business mode. And just be prepared for that. So the kind of things we want to measure here, obviously, how many changes did we make? How many of those were successful? How many failed? You know, where are the changes coming from? What's the cost of doing these changes? Um, how much does that cost us every month? Then from a key performance indicator, well, how many did we do from an IT perspective, changing stuff because there's new, new cool technology? How many were driven by the business? And what is that impact, right? So were we able to make changes that positively affected the business? Um, and if we had downtime, what were the negative effects of that and how do we prevent that going forward? So, John, quick question, um, another great one in line with what you were talking about is, uh, I'm gonna ask the question almost in backwards from how it was presented to me, but um, it really it boils down to the, the individual asking, how do we really make sure that what we're measuring is relevant? And, and what they're saying is that traditionally a lot of metrics that they establish are, in, in, in essence, uh, from the reactive mindset. So how do we ensure from a proactive perspective they're measuring what's actually business relevant? Oh, great question. So it ties back to some of the stuff we were talking about from my perspective. So first of all, you have to have some leadership in that IT function that understands the business that you're in. And I, not just from lip service. In my career in IT, I worked with and for lots of guys who love, guys I should say, people, uh, who love to talk the talk in terms of, yeah, this is the business we're in. and Here's how many cars we sold, or you know, here's how many uh, cans we shipped, and and they pick up the buzzwords and the terms, um, but at heart and by education, they're not really business people. So the first thing is having enough people inside the organization who spend time and know how to talk to the senior leadership of the organization outside IT. So that's the first thing in terms of changing that culture. So you, you absolutely have to have that leadership in the IT organization that's going to insist that we're going to do it a different way. Then they will drive that change in culture um, and it, it does get supported by best practice process where they can say these are the things I want to measure and they're going to ask questions differently. So, you know, instead of uh, looking at, you know, the best way to automate, to handle all the volumes of calls, because they're business people, they're going to say, 
uh, before I do that, would you tell me where are these calls coming from and what are they doing for the business? You know, uh, another example to use there, and I think it's partly because some of the IT folks, there was a change of guard in one of our customers and, and the new folks coming in, and partly they used an external vendor, a large outsourcer got involved. They looked at their password resets. Um, actually, didn't end up being a great thing for us. We were handling all the password resets in thousands a month. Um, yeah, I mean, tens of thousands a month, large organization. And eventually they looked from a business perspective and said, well, who in the audit department decided that the automated password reset required, you know, seven questions? That's not sane. So a senior executive is able to look at that from a budget and, and risk perspective and say, you know what, I think we can take the risk if you knock that down to three questions. And, I mean, the password reset volume dropped dramatically. Hard dollar cost because they were literally paying us to take those calls. So. That's another long way around to say, I guess, it has to happen from the IT leadership perspective, and I think that's why you see the trend of people going out and putting into senior IT roles people who are not technical by nature. Um, and Rick, you might attest to this. We have tried any number of times you know, in, within our organization, own organization to take people who are reactive in nature. That is, their career has been, I come into work, and I will react to what happens to me today based on emails I get, phone calls that I get. That's what my day is going to be like. And then I'm going to go home and sit on the couch and have a beer or go play baseball or whatever I do. And then I'll come in tomorrow and see what's on my plate. And yes, you do have to cycle some of those people out, especially if those people are in the mid to senior management roles in IT. Hope that helped. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I think, yeah, one more slide here, I believe, um, just sort of getting down to, I didn't talk a lot about project problem management, but, but problem management is something that we see organizations struggle a little bit with implementing um, because they do have a challenge in identifying or justifying the cost from doing problem management. I think as IT folks, we tend to overcomplicate that one a little bit too. You know, really, you don't need a large group, but you need that mentality that says, whatever is driving downtime and driving incidents, I want to look at it and I want to eliminate the root cause. Let's change the way we're doing this or let's get rid of that. Uh, you know, a simple example, if you take that one customer, you know, the number of incidents for password resets, the, the root cause of the problem was they had way too many disparate systems and they didn't have a single sign-on. So they identified that and drove towards eliminating that, and then as a workaround in the meantime said, hey, let's go back to the risk department and tell the auditors that uh, they need to swallow harder because we need to drive these costs down. If I can drive the cost down, I can take that money and spend it on implementing a single sign-on and we'll eliminate the root cause in the longer term. And that's essentially the, the logic and thinking. So, so I hope that gives you some concrete kind of tangible example of how this stuff can drive back through adding value to the business. So just to sum up, what have we learned? So the first thing is, you know, pick those sort of key services and the metrics that you're going to drive towards uh, from a business perspective. Review and improve the processes um, to support those metrics and key services. Most of the time that will be incident change, some basic configuration management has to be in place or incident and change gets stalled in terms of their maturity and development. And service level management and service catalogs and in particular a business service catalog perspective leveraging the idle v3 concepts um, really are the areas where we see you know you can get some direct benefit and impact from implementing idle best practices without trying to boil the ocean and, and, uh, and get all carried away. We also recommend that you take a look at what are those visible services that we can track. So what's the business talking about? What are the things that business complains about or wishes or dreams most about from an IT perspective? And how do we track those? Start with a manageable scope. As I said, don't try to boil the ocean. Um, you know, do some very simple things. If you're 
a smaller business and you know a confederated configuration management database seems like a pipe dream. Well, great. So put some stuff in spreadsheets and uh, keep it all on one single server. And your maturity levels from a process perspective go up pretty dramatically. And once again, uh, you demonstrate that value and, and demonstrate the improvements year over year as you move forward. Uh, and my last point would be, you know, once you've done some of that stuff, then in order to be efficient, you are going to have to automate. The good news is that you know, as we see the last three or four years, particularly, and continuing into the future, there's been a consolidation in the IT service management software space and an integration. So, so you have integrated suites of services, um, some of which are available um, at, in the cloud as software as a service and are quite cost effective. So, so once you got your house in order, um, then take a look at automating that stuff. That will not only improve your efficiency, but will also improve, improve the metrics and reporting that you're able to provide to your executive. And once again, that drives back to budget time. So we can have our uh, executives with the information they need at budget time to defend and support, and not so much defend and support, but to me the most important part is they're able to turn that conversation back. So once again, ideally you want to go back at budget time and say to the business, yes, I know what I'm doing. These are the things I do for you. Here's how much they cost. Here's how I know that that's a good value for you because I've compared myself to the IT industry at large and if you can, specifically to our industry. So don't tell me I'm not efficient, politely. Um, what would you like me to do? You set the priorities. It's your money. It's your business. Tell me what you want me to do and I'm happy to do it. And here's the number of chips I'm playing with. If you want to give me some more chips, I can do more for you. Or you can tell me to stop doing something that I'm doing because you don't really need it. It's not impacting your business or do it to a lower service level. Happy to help you. Uh, what can we do for you? And I believe we're done. Questions, comments, smart remarks are all welcome. <laughs> No questions right now. We have those three or four that were posted during the session, so I'll give everyone a few more minutes if they wanted to post a question. Uh, and while we're doing that, again, just to remind everyone, next week, August 21st, uh, same time, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have Sandra McKinsey, who's a senior manager at Baumgar University, presenting Aligning Your Service Strategy with Your Customers, Why Chat is a Critical Component of Your Service Strategy. Uh, some key learning segments that will come out of that, and uh, I know we've had folks from Baumgar in the past, and they do an excellent job in, in preparation and in uh, delivering education for uh, for the masses. So if it's again, if it's relevant to your area within IT or if it's relevant to somebody else and you want to pass along the information and the invite, uh, look for further information in our weekly newsletter and hopefully we see someone from your organization uh, with us next Tuesday, August the 21st. Uh, John, I think I can say that um, the questions were answered. I didn't leave anything really to the end, so I think we're okay for now. Um, if anybody has any other questions, uh, you can uh, email directly to ThoughtRock uh, with the information that's on the screen. Uh, we'll make sure that those uh, those questions get directed to John, and he can follow up directly if, uh, if there's something that comes uh, post-session that you think about today. So again, John, thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone. And for those of you that did inquire, we will have the Thought Rock uh, presentation available with audio and slides in Thought Rock within 24 hours. So you can uh, log in, and, and uh, you'll be able to find it there uh, by the end of uh, tomorrow. Thanks a lot, and uh, we'll hopefully see everyone back here again soon. Bye, bye for now.